Thanks for purchasing this series produced by St. Joseph Communications. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to consider John now by taking an overview, getting the bird's eye view, taking a chapter every class period or two, and using the Navarra Bible as we go. After we're done doing this in a few weeks, we're going to go back and get the worm's eye view, crawling through it much more slowly. As we do an overview study, we're bound to miss certain key topics. We're bound to undertreat other themes that I'd like to draw out perhaps much more than we can. Recall the structure of the gospel, not only now, but as you proceed. Don't lose your way. We're not going to do the, the worm's eye view. We're not going to go at snail's pace yet. We're going to kind of fly over. But in order not to get lost flying, you've got to keep the structure of the gospel in mind. For instance, keep the fact that the prologue, that is chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, is a sort of overture. So go back time and again to the first 18 verses of the fourth gospel and listen for the musical themes, like you do in an overture, that will be developed later on in the gospel. Light, life, word, believe, dwell, and so on. There are all kinds of very weighty and important ideas there. Part one, you notice in the Navarra Bible, beginning in page 25, is the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah, mainly through his ministry of miracles. The first four chapters deal with Jesus' Messiahship through the signs. Note again how John does not use the term miracle, but rather sign, because his understanding of miracle is that these things signify an, an interior glory. His messiahship is there in the first four chapters. In chapter 2, it's in Jerusalem. In chapter 3, it's with Nicodemus, a Pharisee. In chapter 4, it's with the Samaritan woman of all people. And then... The second section of part one is chapter five where Jesus manifests his divinity. He's not just Messiah, he is one with the Father. And so in chapter five you see how the Jews plan to kill him all the more because he claims to be equal with the Father. In chapter six he shows himself to fulfill the greatest festival for Israel's liberty and salvation, the Exodus and the Passover. At the Passover time, he describes himself as the true manna and the bread of life, the one who we have to receive by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He's so stark and emphatic on that point that the majority of disciples are horrified and abandon him. In fact, you're left wondering at the end of chapter 6 if the 12 are really all that's left. So in chapter 6, Jesus reveals himself as the fulfillment of the Passover. In chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, John is drawing more from the Feast of Tabernacles now than the Feast of Passover. The Feast of Tabernacles is a very significant feast in the Jewish calendar, and it might be said as it to be the most important, but what it really does is it directs Israel's attention more to the world than the Feast of Passover did. The Feast of Passover celebrates the exodus out of Egypt and the deliverance of the firstborn sons down in Egypt, whereas the Feast of Tabernacles focuses upon Israel's mission to the nations, their ministry, as they are to communicate the righteousness and truth of God's word, of God's law. Well, now that God's word is made flesh and dwells among us, Israel's ministry is to recognize the word made flesh and to acknowledge the corporate task that belongs to this nation 
in not only receiving, but also in joining with the Messiah in going out to the nations and bringing salvation to the world. But that's precisely where they get bogged down the most. At every step, you see, in a sense, a more and more intense rejection, a greater and greater scandal. It's one thing for him to claim to be the Messiah. Oh yeah, let me see your credentials. It's another thing for him to claim, as he does in 5, chapter 5, to be equal with the Father. That's blasphemous if it isn't right. It's another thing to say, I'm greater than Moses, which in effect represents the sum and substance of the hope of Israel. And I fulfill Passover. I bring you liberty. You're enslaved. Even Moses didn't set you free. Moses didn't even really feed you with that manna, which perishes. I'm the real Moses. I'm the real Passover. I'm going to bring you out of the real bondage that you're still in, and I'm the real manna that you have yet to consume. Ooh, my. Gentle, meek, loving Jesus has hard words to say to people who presume upon God, especially the self-righteous, the professional religious, so to speak, those whose ritual presumption leads them, like the ancient Jews, to think, hey, we're in the church, we haven't done anything so heinous in a public way, at least, as to be excommunicated. You know, I'm not some drunken bum or some prostitute, therefore, I have nothing to worry about in terms of salvation and everlasting life. In other words, this doesn't just apply to ancient Jews. This applies to the same sort of ritual presumption you'll find even in the New Covenant as well. The, the offense is exacerbated the most of all in 7 through 10 as Jesus identifies himself as the Feast of Tabernacles, as the fulfillment of that feast and all of its symbolism, as the one who is prepared to go out into all the world and to announce salvation to the nations, bring them light, and so on. And that is illustrated graphically in chapters 11 and 12. First, in 11, with the miracle of the raising of Lazarus. I mean, that is the most graphic depiction possible of how Christ comes to bring life to the dead. And Lazarus is clearly a symbol of Old Testament Israel, especially the believing remnant within Israel. And then in chapter 12, we really have a turning point. The turning point in the end of part one. Why do we say that? Because all of a sudden, we're about to focus upon the discourses of Jesus. But before it happens, John 12, verse 20, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to, them, said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went with Philip and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them what? Here are some Greeks, some non-Jews, some non-Samaritans, some non-Galileans. These guys are just plain nons. <laughs> They're worthless in terms of the people of Israel concerned. And they say, we want to see Jesus. Up until now, whenever somebody came up to Jesus, his hour was not yet. When his mother came up, he said, woman, my hour has not yet come. In John 7, he says, my hour has not yet come. In John 8, when they try to kill him, they can't because his hour hasn't come. Now, all of a sudden, Greeks, worldlings, non-Israelites, outside the covenant, they say to Philip, we want to see Jesus. What does Jesus say? Eh, I'll think about it. You know, or, well, yeah, maybe tonight we can meet on the sly. No. All of a sudden, I mean, our Messiah makes a mountain out of a molehill, it seems. Look at what he says. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went with Philip and they told Jesus. There are some Greeks who want to see you. And Jesus answered them in verse 23, The hour has come! What? Yeah, for the Son of Man to be glorified. Calm down, Jesus. I, I know you're anxious, but you know, i just just conveying the message that some Greeks want to see you. Yeah. And that's the signal that the hour of the new covenant has come. The salvation of the world is being signaled when the Greeks want to see our Lord. Truly, truly, in the Greek it's Amen, Amen. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The early fathers in the church saw this as Eucharistic image, imagery here, where Jesus sees himself as the grain of wheat that dies in order to bring forth a great harvest. It bears much fruit. Well, what kind of fruit? Not apples and oranges, right? Ultimately bread. Christ's death will bring the bread of life which will bring salvation to all the nations. 
Then it goes on. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus, we just, just said some, some Greeks want to see you. you know, that's all. Yeah, but that is the device that John uses to show the turning point. To prepare us now to really enter into Jesus' own soul. To see how he understands the offering up of his own life. Verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. He was anxious. You could almost translate the term angry. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? There's the hour again. No. For this purpose I have come to, the, to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. So everything has been leading up to this hour. And this hour is now upon them. And that brings about the transition into part two where Jesus reveals himself not through signs and miracles, but in his passion, his death, and resurrection. There's a message for all of the, us in this, as we'll see in the weeks to come, that we are to conform ourselves to Christ. Christ is successful in a public way for the sake of the world. Christ's failures are actually his glory. That's the, the cryptogram for all Christians. He just said, he who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it. Exhibit A, you want to see? It's me. Because I've come to my hour. And it's the hour of his passion. It's the hour of his death. It's the hour of his humiliation and his resurrection. Communicating this message to all Christians. Be ye conformed to Christ. You're successful in your ministry with your gifts in converting people and in deepening the faith of your roommate or your friends or your family for their sake, but you suffer and you fail and you're humiliated for your own sake. We think when we prosper, we're growing. No, when we prosper, others grow. When we fail, then we grow. See, now that's kind of neat. That's just what he said. I think we could probably say it over and over and over again until we're all in our 80s and 90s and still have trouble believing it and still have much greater trouble living it. But that's the transition. Chapters 13 through 17 set this out in a variety of ways in these discourses of Jesus. Beginning in chapter 13, you have the foot washing ceremony. To kind of give you a living parable, Jesus acts like the lowest servant. And then he announces his departure at the end of it. In chapter 14... He declares himself to be the way, the truth, and the life, and he promises his disciples to do greater works by means of the Holy Spirit who will come, who he shall send. And then he gives them the promise of peace. And then in chapter 15, we have the vine discourse. This is all part of the Last Supper. In the vine discourse, we have Jesus saying, I'm the true vine. He abides in me and my words abide in him. You can ask what you will and it will be done for you. And you will bear much fruit, and in your fruit the Father will be glorified. Now we notice that the transition began with a, with a reference by Jesus to a grain of wheat that must fall into the earth and die in order for it to bring forth fruit. The Father saw that as a symbol of Christ, the living bread. Now Christ says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall bear much fruit and glorify my Father. They also detected in that an image of the Eucharist. Because just as the fruit that the vine produces is grapes, and when that's smashed, and when that's distilled, and when that ferments, it brings forth the best wine, so likewise in the Eucharist. And then chapter 16, we have more on the power and the mission of the Holy Spirit, and we really have Jesus' farewell to the disciples. I guess I'd have to say that my favorite chapter in the whole gospel is chapter 17. And that is his high priestly prayer, where he consecrates himself on behalf of his disciples and those who will believe on the basis of their testimony. And he prays not for himself only, not for his disciples only, but for the church in the world. And then in chapters 18 and 19, you have the second section of part two. And that's our Lord's passion. We have much material here that we don't find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, nothing in chapter 18 is really found 
in the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels describe the trial before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Senate. There's nothing of that here. It's simply Annas and Caiaphas, the high priestly duo, and then Pontius Pilate, who becomes a means by which Jesus clarifies the true nature of his kingdom. My kingdom is not of the world. If it was, I'd, ha I'd have soldiers to defend me. But he doesn't mean by that that my kingdom is not to be established in the world. His point is that my kingship is built upon truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says. And he says, so my kingdom is established by means of truth. Not power, not majority vote, not terrorism, not tanks, but truth. So what does Pilate say? Cynically, what is truth? A true politician. <laughs> Give me majority vote or give me the military. You can have truth. But it's because Christ's kingdom is not of the world that it takes preeminence over every kingdom that is of the world in the world. Because the only kingdom that can last in the world is the kingdom that's not of the world. It's the kingdom of truth. Truth is timeless and permanent. So Christ is not, in a sense, saying, well, hey, guys, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with directing the world's affairs. I'm the king of heaven. No, he's the king of kings in John's mind. So the fact that his kingship is not of the world is precisely the reason why it must be established in every square inch of the world. Because it isn't contingent or dependent upon the military or a majority, but rather his father in heaven. And then the account of Jesus' passion and death in chapter 19 is just shot through with Passover imagery. Only John describes Jesus as dying the same hour, being crucified the same hour, that the Passover lambs were slaughtered in Jerusalem. Only John describes how Jesus wore a seamless garment, just like the high priest wore the kiton in order to sacrifice in the temple for the Passover and the other major festivals. Only John catches that a hyssop branch lifts the sponge with the wine. The hyssop branch was used to smear the lamb's blood on the doorposts. Only John is the one who catches that none of his bones were broken to fulfill scripture, like none of the Passover lamb's bones were allowed to be broken if you were to consume it. In other words, John sees Christ as the high priest in chapter 17 who consecrates himself to sacrifice, and then in chapters 18 and 19 he sees himself as the victim, as the lamb, as the sacrifice itself. And we're just scratching the tip top shallowest portion of the surface. And then finally, the last section of part two, chapters 20 through 21, are the appearances of the risen Christ. And again, these are unique to John. They're not found in the Synoptic Gospels. Both the incidents of uh, the Sea of Tiberias and also the questioning of Peter at the charcoal fire. All right, now that we've reviewed the overview that the Navarra Bible offers us, I want to mention that we're not going to treat, but you need to read and just digest pages 30 all the way through 40. In fact, if I were to give you an assignment for Monday, it would be to read chapters 30 through 40, because you really can't get the most out of this commentary unless you read this 10-page synopsis of the theology of John. It's very good. The theology of the Trinity is found more in John than Matthew, Mark, and Luke put together. The theology of faith in John is perhaps deeper than the three synoptics put together. Likewise, charity is John's favorite theme. Love constitutes the new law. He treats that. If you were to add up all of the sacramental images in the synoptic gospels, they probably couldn't even compare to what you find in John. So the discussion of the sacraments is important there in chat on page 36. Although Luke has more on the Blessed Virgin Mary than John in terms of the infancy narrative, we have much more what you could call Mariology, or a development of the significance of Mary. I'm going to be using an article later in the semester by Father Grassi, Joseph Grassi, G-R-A-S-S-I, who has written uh, several articles, but one in particular about the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Gospel of John. He argues that John has deliberately structured his Gospel so that she appears at the beginning, at the climax midpoint, and also at the end. There at the foot of the cross, when the beloved disciple receives her as his own mother. 
So he structured the gospel not to talk about Mary a lot, but to talk about Mary at the beginning, the middle, and the end, so you know her importance. Now I want to spend the rest of our time on the prologue itself. Turn with me then to John chapter 1. We could have a whole course just on this 18 verse section. It's so rich and so deep. And at the end of the course, you'd feel like you took a sip from the ocean. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness hasn't overcome it. Now, in a quick reading of the first five verses, something strong should strike you. A reminiscence from Genesis 1. First of all, because the phrase that initiates the gospel is drawn verbatim from Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning. Hene harke. Arche is the translation, the Greek word, for beginning. In the Hebrew, you have the term bereshith for in the beginning. Bereshith. The Greek is in Hey, Arche, in the beginning. And the Hebrew, in the beginning, Bereshith. Now, the reason I draw out these two terms is because in both cases, the term for beginning is double-sided. It has a kind of double meaning, like Rashith. Be is the prefix, in. Interestingly, Be in Hebrew, just like En, but especially Be, can mean not only in the beginning, but it can also mean through, or with, or by, and this sort of thing. Both terms, arche in Greek and rashith in Hebrew, can be translated and should be translated beginning. But the plain and simple core of the terms basically means first. First. In the first is an awkward translation, so we're going to stick with in the beginning, but I want to draw out the double-sidedness of the terms. If I say, Steve, you're first in the class, what could that mean? Well, it could mean one of two things. It could mean sequence, or it could mean rank. That's the way we use the word first. It could mean first in a series, and I could be starting with the dumbest student, huh? or it could mean first in rank, and I'm talking about the smartest student. Or it could mean first in the room today, or the first to sign up, or the first in his class. You see then that it can refer to time or power. You'll discover that John deliberately uses double-sided terms. The technical term is double entendre. He'll often use a wordplay, a kind of pun, if you will, in order to force the careful reader to raise the question, well, which is it? And he invites you to recognize that almost in every single case that he uses this double-sided term, it's both. It means both. You just have to figure out how. Jesus is in the beginning. That is, he goes all the way back into Genesis. And he is the one who creates. And it's in Christ that God creates. So he's first. That's the one sense. But he's also the highest. That's another sense. In fact, the Hebrew term resh or rosh can often mean head, like the head of a clan or the head of a tribe. So in the beginning was the Word. That is, Christ, the Word, was first before creation, and Christ, the Word, is also highest. That is, he's the Lord of creation in rank. Paul seems to be aware of this flexible meaning in the Hebrew. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. We see Paul's outlook on Jesus' role in creation in verse 15. Colossians 1.15 reads, He is the image of the invisible God. Well, that is also reminiscent of Genesis 1 because, after all, God made man in his image and likeness. If man is made in the image of God, 
Paul is telling us that Jesus is the image of God. Christ is the pattern for mankind, for Paul in Colossians 1.15. We're going to see that John says basically the same thing in other words. In John 1, Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. We're created in the image, he is the image. The firstborn of all creation. Now the firstborn here cannot mean sequence. Prototakos in Hebrew thinking does not mean primarily the first to be born. It means rank. The firstborn is the heir apparent, the successor, the crown prince, the one who is to take over the estate from the father. All right, think of, uh, think of Jacob and, e and Esau, the two sons of Isaac. Who is the firstborn? No. Jacob. Well, it depends what you mean. That's what... In other words, you're right. Esau is the firstborn chronologically, but that's inconsequential as far as God, the covenant people, are concerned because Jacob's the one who receives the blessing. Jacob's born second, but Jacob is the firstborn, and he gets the father's blessing. Firstborn primarily means rank, order, heir apparent, the one who inherits. So Christ, as the image of the invisible God, is the heir apparent to his father, and his father's estate is namely the cosmos, the, the creation, the universe. He's the firstborn of all creation. Why? Mainly because he's not created. The Arians used this verse back in the fourth century to try to argue that Jesus was the first thing created, missing the Hebrew background of the term firstborn. Verse 16 of Colossians 1 gives it away that Paul is thinking like a Hebrew. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth. Just like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, Bereshith. Be can mean in the head. Who is the head for Paul? Christ. So in him all things were created, in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him. That's another translation of the prefix be in Hebrew. And for him. In other words, he's drawing out in this case, the three-sided meaning of Bereshith. It means that in Christ, God created the heavens and the earth. It means through Christ and for Christ. And then he also draws out secondarily the sequential priority of Jesus. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In other words, he's not only the beginning of the first creation in Genesis, but he's the beginning of the new creation of the new covenant as well. Back to John 1. I believe that John is making a similar point, that Jesus wasn't waiting in the wings. Father, is it, is it time to go out center stage yet? Is it time for me to be born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit? No? Got to wait another thousand years? Okay, just give me the cue. Hum -de -dum -de -dum -de -dum -de -dum. Take a sip, boy, practice my lines, you know. Jesus wasn't waiting in the wings. All right? The whole production is Christ's. He was the divine agency in Genesis 1. It isn't the Father saying, Hey, son, just sit still. Have I got a creation for you to redeem? <laughs> He's the creator. He is the word spoken by the Father that brought it all into being. But He's not just the word that brought it into being. He is the pattern, the blueprint that it is to be conformed to. That's why we're going to need two creations. Because in the one case, we have nature being established, the world as a world being made by Christ. After the blue, after the pattern of Christ, but it's a mock-up. It's just a, it's kind of a scaled-down model of the real thing. But the real thing that God has in store isn't the first creation. That's, that's sort of like the, um, that's sort of like the tadpole. That's sort of like, what do you call a little caterpillar that crawls into the cocoon, all right? The real thing that God has in store is the second creation, the new creation, the butterfly, if you will, or the frog. The, the fact is, Christ is the one who establishes the first creation. He is the word spoken that brings it all into being, but it's brought into being for Christ to fill it, for Christ to redeem it, for Christ to to assume it to himself, in effect. And that occurs when God is made man, when the Word becomes flesh. So the first creation is ultimately for the second creation. This is John's perspective. 
You can see it especially in his other book, Revelation. In Revelation 21, you see so strongly Genesis imagery, again, creation themes. Genesis, I'm sorry, Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And it goes on talking about all of the other new things that he sees. A new Jerusalem, unlike the old Jerusalem of the old covenant. Verse 5, And he, he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. That's the why he made, that's the why he made, that's why he made things. <laughs> I'll get it out yet. He made the world in order to renew the world. He created nature in order for there to be something to give himself to. The old covenant establishes the order of nature. The new covenant infuses that order with grace. Grace is nothing less than God's own life. That's the general way of understanding divine grace. The particular way of understanding grace in John's mind is that it's sonship. The life of God that we receive from Christ is the life of Christ. And since Christ is an eternal Son, the eternally begotten Son, then the grace we receive is the life of sonship. In the beginning, we are made as creatures, dignified, noble, and then God fashions us after His own image and likeness. In the new creation, however, He gives to us, in Christ, permanent sonship. It's unlosable. You could see other themes from Genesis in Revelation 21 and 22. Just in passing, I mentioned Gen uh, Revelation 22, verse 1. He showed me the river of the water of life through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river. The tree of life grows in the new heavens and the new earth of the new Jerusalem. Christ has come to renew creation. A new heavens and a new earth. Behold, I make all things new. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, behold, a new creation. And the new creation we are, it's not that God just says, okay, let's annihilate the old creation and let's start again. Let's make the grass a little greener. Let's make the mountains a little higher. It isn't that at all. It's let's deify, let's divinize, let's grace the universe. In 1 John chapter 3, John says this even more clearly. 1 John 3 verse 1. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. That's my favorite verse in the Bible. We are not just called children of God. We are. That is the distinctive feature of Christianity. It's the religion of sonship. And it's the most distinctive feature of Catholicism. Because non-Catholic Bible Christians say, when we're justified, we're declared to be just, but we're not transformed and made just. The Catholic Church alone says that justification and salvation consist in nothing less than not just being called the children of God, but in actually receiving a mystical infusion of the life of Christ and nothing less. That is the distinctive feature of Catholicism. Pope Pius XI said it explicitly. Ours is a religion of divine sonship. We are made partakers of the divine nature. That might seem a little offensive. A friend of mine once said, that's just pantheism. I said, no, it's not. It's Peter's theology. He says it so clearly in his epistle in 2 Peter chapter 1. Oh, let's see. It just says this, You may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion, in verse 4, and become partakers of the divine nature. All of this is getting at what John is talking about. Back to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was, was, uh, was with God, and the Word was God. I should also add that this is the most emphatic and explicit statement of Christ's deity anywhere in the New Testament. I wish we had another hour or two to deal with the, how the Jehovah's Witnesses mangle this text. You can see me afterwards. There's a basic law of grammar, Greek grammar, known as Colwell's Rule, that they just simply ignore or deny. Colwell's Rule 
says that this can't be translated like the Jehovah's Witnesses do. And the word was a God. They say, well, there's no definite article the, like elsewhere. But Colwell, E.C. Colwell of the University of Chicago, made it clear that whenever you find a noun, an anarthus noun, that is, without a definite article, in the predicate nominative position, it doesn't take the definite article. So you wouldn't expect it to have a definite article. You would just simply translate it God. Not a God, but the God, because John's not a polytheist. He doesn't believe in lots of gods running around, like the Jehovah's Witnesses do. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and it goes on to talk about how the life was the light of men. More Genesis imagery. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he says, let there be light, and he separates the light from darkness. And then, as he produces the earth and the inhabitants of the earth, he infuses his own life to them as well. And once again, Christ is the one who is doing this. Let me just mention here, by the way, that... Oh, I'll get to that in a second. I want to finish this first. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony, marturia, to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness to the light. Later on, we're going to spend more time on John the Baptist, but it's kind of strange that here, John the Baptist is introduced in the middle of a very beautiful, elegant, poetic passage. Sort of like, we interrupt this message to tell you about this guy named John. <laughs> oh. Many scholars believe that John's gospel was written with the former disciples of John the Baptist in mind. Because there were many people who follow John the Baptist up to his beheading who didn't then follow Jesus. So, what are you going to do? This is, just one, you know, this is just one hypothesis that some scholars give. But the idea is not without merit. Because in the book of Acts we read about how, yes, in fact, there were disciples of John who had not received word of Jesus' baptism but instead only knew the baptism of John. Turn with me to the, uh, the book of Acts. I believe it's Acts 18. One of the greatest preachers in the early church was a man by the name of Apollos. Verse 24, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and expounded to him the way of God more accurately. Look down in chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And there were twelve of them and all. Suggesting that Apollos was not some lone ranger who just kind of happened to, you know, find himself in Never Never Land for a little while. This, I think, is a reputable hypothesis that needs to be seriously considered here in John. I think John may well have been writing with John the Baptist's disciples in mind. It would make sense if John, according to, to tradition, was the bishop of what city? Ephesus. Where is the book of Acts describing this incident with Apollos in Ephesus? So there were lots of disciples of John the Baptist floating about who never even heard that there was a Holy Spirit, much less to receive him in baptism. This is why I believe, I think, that John interrupts this beautiful poetic passage to say, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony. That's what he said he came for, to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. 
He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. Listen up, guys. You disciples of John the Baptist, the best is yet to come. Yeah, John was the greatest man to be born of woman in the Old Covenant. He was the greatest prophet, Jesus says elsewhere. And he came to fulfill the Old Covenant. If there is one underestimated, underrated figure in the Bible, it's John the Baptist. No, man, no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. And his ministry was to, in a sense, bring the Old Covenant to an effective and profound closing. John's whole life and ministry, and I mean his whole life, was dedicated to preaching that we cannot save ourselves, humans, and especially fellow Jews. All we can do is posture ourselves in repentance, like little, little baby birds that just open their mouth to their mother as she drops little worms. That's what we are as repentant creatures. We say, we don't deserve to be your children. We have no claim on being your children. We are only creatures. We are only slaves and disobedient ones at that. We have got no basis to make claims of, on God's mercy. And so here we are. It's your mercy, it's your grace, and yours alone. John was to get the people to see that with 2020 clarity. That's what his ministry is for. So that when the light comes, we see the light and recognize that we are in darkness. He goes back to that theme in verse 9. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. The greatness of the gospel, of course, the new covenant, is that every man now is included. Verse 10. He was in the world. That's a very important theme in John's gospel, the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. The world is the sphere in which sin has dominion. On the one hand, we're told to love not the world. On the other hand, we're told that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, which is it? Well, it's both. God loves his creation. But he sees its radical inadequacy to receive his grace. He sees its radical incapacity to transform itself into what it was made to be. And so the world by itself is a detestable place. But of course it isn't by itself. God made it and God dwells in it and God is redeeming it. But the world is a power that deludes us into thinking that we're by ourselves and that God is like an absentee landlord, that God is distant, far away, and relatively ignorant of the goings-on around us. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came unto his own, literally his own home, his own things, his own world, and his own people received him not. That is, the world was created to be God's home, but there was a kind of revolt, a coup, if you will, and some rebels took over. And when Christ came home, his own people rebelled. Not only did they not recognize him or receive him, they persecuted him and his followers. He came to his own home and his own people received him not. That's a tragic message. But the greatest verse of all is verse 12. This is my favorite in the prologue. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, again in the overture we're hearing key words that are going to be developed later, who believed in his name, he gave exousia. Not dunamis, power, but authority. Usia is the word for being, substance. Exousia, authority, in the sense that we receive the very being, the stuff, the substance of God. We receive authority and power to become children of God. Not just some legal declaration. We receive the exousia, the authority, the claim, the certainty, the reality, the stuff of God. To become servants of God? No, that's what we are by nature, at creation. To become children of God. That is not what we are when we're gener generated through our natural parents. We become children of God when we are regenerated through our Father, through the Holy Spirit, in a sense, almost like a spiritual mother, and through the Son, from whom we receive sonship. 
We are born of the Spirit. We are begotten of the Father in the Son. We become children of God. We've got to wake up to the incredible dignity that is ours, to the incredible wealth that is ours by birthright. We should have no identity crisis as Catholic Christians. We should have a deep humility, but a kind of humble pride, too. This idea of self-image, having a bad self-image, is just craziness for Christians. But on the other hand, it's even more crazy for Christians to clamor to go about trying to get a good self-image. We're not to be focusing on ourselves, we're to be focusing upon other people. Our personhood is just like Christ's, that is, it's established in relationship. And so those who relate to us should be those that we focus on. It's a very sad state. It's a sorry time when a society gets wrapped up in making each member feel good about themselves. Because Jesus says the only time you're going to really feel good about yourself is when you deny yourself and you give yourself away. I'm not saying that a good self-image is a bad thing. I'm just saying a preoccupation with it is dangerous. Because it almost invariably leads people to forget about the real climax, self-sacrifice, self-donation. I agree. If you don't think you're any good, you're not going to want to give yourself away, except maybe to your enemies. You have to believe that you're worth something for you to want to give yourself away. But to have a good self-image is penultimate. It's 11 o'clock, midnight, the climax. It all strikes when you see that you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross and imitate Christ. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born from above, born not of bloods, the Greek is plural, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but that man is not anthropos, humanity, but male. In other words, we're not to become, we, we, we do not become children of God through natural means, through intercourse. Sexuality does not communicate the sanctity of sonship. Sexuality makes us creatures destined to image God, but only regeneration, when we're reborn from above through the Spirit, are we actually made children of God, who are born, in other words, not of sexual intercourse. The term for blood probably denotes uh, body fluids were usually called bloods in the Greek language, and that's the way the Hebrew thought. Intercourse involves the exchange of this life substance, these body fluids. So we're not born of the bloods, the the bodily fluid, nor of the will of the flesh, that is carnal desire. You see your wife and you're attracted, you want to renew your covenant. That's not the way you're made a child of God. Nor of the will of the male, because down through the ages, the male initiative is more commonly the, uh, the basis on which intercourse occurs. We are born rather of God, the will of God. And then the crescendo in verse 14, and the word became flesh. If only we could hear this as though it was the first time. We would tremble like the angels do at this moment. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek there has the meaning of tabernacling. It's a term used in the Old Testament for how God dwelt in the midst of His people in the tabernacle. Skene. It's this idea of He takes up, He pitches His tent in our very midst full of grace and truth. Two terms, again, just loaded with rich meaning from the Old Testament. Truth, emet, is not just facticity. The term for truth in Hebrew, emet, is rather total trustworthiness, reliability. God is absolutely truthful. And the term for grace in Hebrew is even bigger, hesed. Hesed is the love, the loyalty, the devotion that you show to members of one family. And in the Old Testament, Hebrew people saw themselves bonded in kinship in an unbreakable way. The duty of hesed is the greatest of all. It's an unconditional, absolute loyalty to one's kinsmen. And Christ is full of hesed. In other words, the Word became flesh. God became man. 
The Son of God became the Son of Man to become our oldest brother. And being kinsman, he is now full of hesed, full of grace. Charis, we get the word charisma from that, or charismatic for that matter. He is full of grace and truth. He is full of charis and aletheia. We have beheld his glory. The word doxa in the Greek is a weak rendering of a greater and stronger word in Hebrew, kavod, K-A-B-O-D. Kavod literally means weightiness. The sum total of God's infinite heaviness, His being, that's His glory. When you see God's glory, you fall flat on your face and you think you're dead. It just takes your breath away, it takes your being away. You can see it in Exodus 33 and 34. When the glory of the Lord passes by, God says, Moses, quick! Put your head in the rock. Don't look upon that glory or you're going to be smitten. So the glory of the Lord is what fills Christ along with grace and truth. And we have beheld His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father. If Christianity is the religion of sonship, John's Gospel is the Gospel of sonship. I'm reading now from one of my favorite Russian Christian writers, Nikolai Fyodorov, who in this essay entitled The Restoration of Kinship Among Mankind, mentions the fact that the synoptic gospels, the whole morality of the first three gospels, consists in the call to be converted into a child, to be born again as a son of man, and to come to God. But he goes on to say, the gospel of John is the highest expression of Christianity and the complete contradiction of Islam and the Koran. Islam consists of Islam, submission, servility, slavery. Christianity consists of sonship, being a child of God, being in the household of faith, being in God's Trinitarian family forever and calling it home. And saying Abba in the process, which means Papa, Daddy. And so it is, glory is of the only Son from the Father, and we are the ones who receive our sonship directly from Christ. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his pleroma, his fullness, have we all received grace upon grace. In other words, grace abounding. It's out of control. There's no way to measure it now. God is just pouring out grace so copiously you can't even begin to count it. The law was given through Moses. A little bit of grace. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ because Christ is grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has, the Greek word there can be translated, made him known. We get the word exegete from this Greek word. To exegete a scripture text means to tear it apart and to interpret it right, to get at its meaning. He has exegeted the Father. Jesus is the one who opens up the mystery of God as our Father and makes him known as our Father by giving to us his own sonship. In this overture of the prologue, we have all of the themes being planted like seeds, or better yet, like time bombs. They're going to be going off in the next 21 chapters. Read it carefully. Read it many times. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we ask, O Holy Spirit, that you would seal this truth within our hearts, that our lives might reflect In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation produced by St. Joseph Communications. St. Joseph Communications offers a wide variety of audio and video materials on scripture study, apologetics, spirituality, family life, and more. For more information on the many fine products available from St. Joseph Communications, please call toll-free 800-526-2151. You may write for a free catalog to St. Joseph Communications, P.O. Box 1911, Suite 83, Tehachapi, California, 93581 or visit our website at www.saintjoe.com That's www.saintjoe.com Thanks for listening and may God richly bless you and your family. This sound recording is copyright 2002 by St. Joseph Communications.
This recorded presentation may not be broadcast, reproduced, or redistributed in any manner or form without the express written permission of St. Joseph Communications, Incorporated.